Hey there, this is James Carberry, founder of Sweetfish Media and one of the co-hosts of this show. For the last year and a half, I've been working on my very first book. In the book, I share the three-part framework we've used as the foundation for our growth here at Sweetfish. Now, there are lots of companies that have raised a bunch of money and have grown insanely fast, and we featured a lot of them here on the show. We've decided to bootstrap our business, which usually equates to pretty slow growth. But using the strategy outlined in the book, we're on pace to be one of Inc.'s fastest growing companies in 2020. The book is called Content-Based Networking, How to Instantly Connect with Anyone You Want to Know. If you're a fan of audiobooks like me, you can find the book on Audible, or if you like physical books, you can also find it on Amazon. Just search content-based networking or James Carberry, C-A-R-B-A-R-Y in Audible or Amazon, and it should pop right up. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I'm Logan Lyles with Sweetfish Media. I'm joined today by Nancy Duarte. She is the CEO of Duarte Inc. She's also a best selling author. Her most recent book, Data Story Explain Data and Inspire Action Through Story, is going to be a big part of the conversation today. Nancy, welcome to the show. How's it going today? It's going great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Nancy, we just had to have you on because, you know, a lot of marketers that we talk to today are feeling this tension between being data-driven and being creative and being a good storyteller. And I love the way that that your book, Data Story, kind of brings those together. Before we get into some of the tactical applications that we want to unpack from your book today, um, I would love for you to let people know who aren't as familiar with you a little bit about yourself and what you and your team are up to these days. Awesome. Yeah, I write books, but I have a firm um, called Duarte that helps millions of people communicate better so that they can change themselves and change their organizations for the better. And we do that through empathetic communication planning and story-infused presentations and delivery coaching. So we'll either do it for you as a service or we'll teach you how to be a brilliant communicator for yourself. I love it. And said so so succinctly. Obviously, you guys practice what you preach. So Nancy, (laughs) we're going to be talking about about, you know, uh, four key sections from your book, you know, you talk about communicating with data, applying a story structure, um, using clear visuals and making the data stick. I'm really excited um, to dive into that fourth one because I think that's that's where a lot of marketers that, that we speak to struggle. Either they, you know, they have a lot of data, but they struggle with communicating it um, and especially getting it to stick. And a fellow podcaster, Jay Akunzo, he's been talking a lot about, you know, in marketing, it's not about just gaining attention. It's about holding it. And I think that'll be, you know, a key part of the things that that we talk about today. As we jump into the first section of your book, Communicating with Data, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, just in general, but especially in the context of, of marketing and brands, where they're getting it wrong in just approaching the data that they have and trying to communicate with it. Yeah, it's interesting because marketing has become, uh, used to be considered more of a creative kind of um, a role. And now that data is um, part of it, we have a lot of people that are way deep in the insights and deep, deep, deep in the data. And a lot of times what happens is we um, they see insights in the data we um, and can actually even see the action to take in the data, but sometimes they don't know how to shape it as a communicator. So it's back to that like uh, ability to be able to form a point of view, you find the, there's one of two things happens when you're digging in the data. You identify a problem or you see an opportunity. How you package that problem and opportunity that you found in the data will determine about whether your data was useful or not. So you have to actually shape it in a very meaningful and, um, and powerful way, but also give yourself permission to do more than just be the data geek. You have to take a point of view and actually unpack that or, or it won't go anywhere. I love that. Do you do you recommend? Uh, and maybe this leads us into the the next section of your book, talking about the story structure. You know, you either identify a problem or an opportunity. You know, is mm-hmm. there uh, kind of a a way to approach? Okay, we want to talk about the problem, or we want to communicate the opportunity. Which should marketers kind of key in on first? Do they do do you see them? You know, getting one before the other sometimes once that data starts to bubble up to the surface. I think sometimes. 
sometimes it, th- there's a three-act structure, a way to actually convey it in the shape of a data story, whether it is an opportunity or a problem. It's just a matter of being able to take a stance on the data. So many people that are in data feel like, oh, it's not, it's outside my pay grade to take a stance on it or create a point of view about it. And your point of view will be a problem or an opportunity. And some people don't like to be wrong <laughs> and they won't take a stance. And um, and so that's the big thing. So the, once you find the problem or the opportunity, you would definitely uh, shape it into a three-act story structure. I love it. So it, it doesn't necessarily uh, matter problem or opportunity, whichever you're keying in on, but apply that that three-act structure to it and make sure that you take a stand. I mean, uh, James mm-hmm. and I, the founder of Sweetfish here, we uh, regularly do behind the curtains episodes where we talk about some of the things that we're learning. And we did an entire episode on the fact that thought leadership is talked about a lot in marketing today, especially in B2B. And you can't really be a thought leader unless you take a stand on something. You know, uh, you yeah. are going to repel some people, but you are going to draw those who, as Simon Sinek says, you know, believe what you believe, uh, draw them closer into you. As people start to take that stand, tell that story, something I've heard, you know, Donald Miller talk about is, you know, we get it wrong. We, we start to tell the story, but we're the center of the story. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, he yeah, I adore him and we he learned some of those uh, concepts from my TED talk which is a lot about when we are uh, the communicator sometimes we feel like we're the central figure, right? We are talking the most, we have something very urgent that we feel needs to be conveyed, but in reality the communicator is not the hero or the central figure of what needs to happen the audience is who you're speaking to is. So if you don't communicate in a way that's empathetic to the people in the room, your idea will die. Like they are the hero. They are the ones that will grab your idea and run with it. They will grab your idea and make it happen. They will grab your idea and turn it into actions. And if you don't consider them and defer to them as the hero of your messaging, they will not run out with your idea. They, you know, they, and so you, in reality, in this relationship with who you're talking to, the communicator's role is one of mentor. We insert ourselves into the life of our audience or readership or listenership at a moment where we're there to help them get unstuck. It's not about me. It's not about how, it's not about my company. It's not about any of that. It's really about helping others get unstuck. So the stance of how you communicate changes when you consider the audience the hero and you as the mentor. Mm -hmm. I I see that a lot in just, you know, you can read those stale press releases. You know, we Mm. we are an industry leader in da-da-da-da-da, and it it just automatically has this tone when when you put it in this context, right, Nancy, where they're trying to make uh, their company the the hero of the story. We have have this uh, to offer. And, And what you talk about is we need to be Yoda to Luke. We need to do Dumbledore to Harry Potter. We need to be Mm -hmm. Gandalf to Frodo, whichever, you know, franchise uh, books or exactly. movies that, that you like the most. And mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about, you know, what what really is the impact there of, of inserting yourself as, as the guide or the mentor rather than framing yourself as the hero and, and how people are able to identify and insert themselves into that story then? Yeah, uh, to make your product or service desirable, it has to have usefulness to the consumer, whether that's a B2B or B2C consumer that's going to consume your goods or services. And they're just you know, running around in their own life. And they're, when they get stuck, that's the role of a mentor. So in myths and movies, a mentor does three things. It helps the hero get unstuck. It brings a magical gift or a special tool. Every time your customer interacts with you, they should feel that way. Well, I'm, I'm unstuck. Oh my gosh, I have this new magical skill or this new magical tool that's going to help me be, help me be better, help me be stronger. You think about the moments in a movie when the mentor stepped in, they usually needed a bit of guidance. They needed a new, you know, they needed a lightsaber and the force, you know, and that's what we're to be to our customers is this, this, this magical presence that helps them in their journey. And so we get so caught up in our own journey sometimes that we forget we're actually a moment in someone else's journey. Um, that's a very important moment for them to get unstuck. Mm, I love that. And the thing, you know, that that I've heard as well on this point is when we frame ourselves and our brand as the hero, what we forget is that 
three quarters or, or two thirds of the movie, typically, uh, the hero is in a pretty bad state. They're trying to get yeah. unstuck. They're weak. They're they're trying to get up the mountain. And so by framing ourselves as the hero and saying, oh, we have all the answers, it doesn't quite fit with the narrative that we understand <laughs> in myths and movies, right? Exactly. Actually, there's math. It's 80% of the story is actually conflict is in the, com- the middle. So the first act is only 10%. The main conflict where the protagonist is going through all this stuff is 80%. And then the ending is 10%. If you can believe it, you're right. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, uh, Nancy, about as we apply this story structure to data, what are some of the things that you recommend to, to help folks who are trying to communicate, especially folks listening to this that are in B2B marketing? How can they uh, take that data? As you mentioned, the first step is identify the problem or opportunity. Now you want to apply a repeatable, the three-act structure mm-hmm. of a story to, to that data. Um, you don't want to make yourself the hero. You want to make your your buyers the hero, um, making that data stick, telling a compelling story. What are some of the common characteristics when you see great presentations, great stories, um, and maybe great presentations is, you know, a, a bit of an oxymoron there because, you know, as you've said before, presentations usually make us fall asleep where stories <laughs> make us come alive. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us about some of the pitfalls and opportunities there as we get to the next stage and start to communicate and try and get this data to stick in folks' minds. Yeah, what's interesting, especially about marketers, is there's two ways we use presentation software. One of them is for a staged talk or a really kind of controlled meeting where you've got messaging that's very important, like an all-hands meeting or an industry event. But a lot of times the people working in data and marketing are creating what we've coined as slide docs. And you can actually go to slidedocs.com and download these beautiful templates. Um, This data storybook is a little bit more centralized on the slide doc concept, which is I found found a problem or opportunity in the data, and now I need to unpack it, show the statistics, and we're going to take it, make a recommendation that's going to lead to action. So what's interesting is a data story comes long before a presentation or an industry meeting. What you've done is found a problem or opportunity, we're going to take action. And then once that recommendation gets approved by an executive or gets funded, then it kicks off a whole bunch of presenting that needs to happen. So data a lot of times is put into a slide doc, and this whole book is a lot about how do you frame what you're asking people to do? How do you pick the best verb? So I went through thousands of slides. We, we have the honor and privilege of working the highest performing brands in the world and have for almost 30 years. And we sussed out, we I analyzed all these data slides. And the, the funnest thing to find was a pattern to the verbs. There's performance verbs and process verbs, and then there's modality verbs. And to get it on and have it resonate on the desk of an executive, you got to pick the right verb, actually, which is the most important thing. What is the action I need to do from the data? And what is the best verb that's going to resonate so this gets approved and we move forward? So it's a lot about speeding up decision-making and communication around the data and using a three-act story structure and a three-act supporting structure to um, communicate in a way so it gets traction. Decisions get made quicker in my Mm -hmm. own firm. Like, I don't know, having data in a way has slowed things down because, you know, we used to just manage from our gut sometimes. And we would get to a point right, right. meeting and we've got all this consensus, everyone's excited. And then someone will be like, do you think we can get data to support this is the exact right decision and way to go, you know? And so it's like, it, we just got to make data work for us instead of us working for the data. Yeah. Can you speak to those? You you touched there, Nancy, on the those three verb types, performance, process, mm-hmm. and modality. When when each is is best used, kind of uh, unpack the differences there uh, as folks think about, you know, I'm just coming off of our annual leadership team retreat mm-hmm. here at Sweetfish that you and I were talking about. Mm-hmm. And this this idea that, man, words matter as as we pick our objectives for the year and those sorts yeah. of things. So I'm kind of geeking out on on verbiage and, and on words right now. So I'd love to dig into those uh, three mm-hmm. that you touched on there a little bit. 
Yeah, it's great. Cause I was going to say that as we were talking about OKRs and um, what there's different verbs that you use and some are performance verbs and some are process verbs. So a performance verb would be something very closely tied to a KPI or an OKR. It's something that actually is, a, is something that's big and can be measured. Your process verbs are the are the smaller actions you're going to take to accomplish this big performance verb. So if you look at like to run is, is maybe the performance you're going to do, but the actions you're going to take is you're going to pump your arms, you're going to breathe through your lungs, you're going to pump your legs. So there's micro verbs that support a bigger mm-hmm. performance verb. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of tell if you've picked a process verb because it's kind of binary. You've either done it or you've not done it. Whereas a performance verb is more measured over time and you're actually improving or increasing or changing the data trajectory. Like, oops, this is what the data says. Oh, it's a problem. So we need to put a performance verb in place so we change the data's trajectory. So that was one of the funnest findings in this whole thing. And I gave like a whole page to all the different verbs so you can actually see them sorted in performance verbs. And then the modalities are, um, are we going to change? Is Are we changing? Are we staying steadfast? Or are we, I don't have the modality chart in front of me, but they all kind of feed into accomplishing your outcomes. Right. So I, I want to touch on something that that you mentioned there uh, a second ago, talking about slide docs, talking about, you know, the another big section of the book is communicating with clear visuals. And, you know, we're an audio only podcast, so folks can't see, you know, the the data story book here on, on my desk. But one of the things that you just struck me is, and this is a big, thick book. It, it, it's large print, but it's very easy to be able to flip through and grab some, some nuggets and, and be pulled in at a certain point. So I would love for you to speak to, you know, the power of visuals where folks Mm -hmm. are kind of maybe getting it wrong. You talked a little bit about, you know, where data is initially gathered and then how that's translated to presentations. There can be somewhat of a disconnect there, right? Yeah, and I think it's easy to make things complicated visually pretty quickly. And it did feel a little bit like hypocrisy if I couldn't create a book that lived up to everything <laughs> that the book states. Um, yeah. There were there were some neat um, visual revelations that I have. So there's a lot of content in this book that's not out there. And when I went through these thousands of data slides and, and taped them up on my wall, there was actually a pattern that I'd never seen before. And that was the pattern of annotations. Like when you visualize data, our, you know, Excel, Tableau, all those tools, they've gotten better in, um, at plotting the charts. So our charts aren't by default ugly. Now, they used to be ugly by default less than five years ago. But what my team does that was so spectacular, I actually just got emotional when I saw it, is we don't just plot the chart. So we'll plot the chart, maybe put it in the, the presentation tool, but then we annotate it. We put a whole nother layer of communication that says, hmm, the most important thing on here is the gap between the height of these two bars. And we'll visually identify new math. We'll add the math that's the gap between the two bars. And then we'll we'll visually draw the eye into the gap, let's say. So there's this whole annotation taxonomy in here too that's really powerful of what you need to do to overlay on top of your data that's clean and clear and simple so that what's the most important thing will stand out. And that's the thing about visuals. You need to mute visually mute some things and make other things contrast out against it. And you need to be wise in understanding what is the one thing, if they picked up Mm -hmm. one thing from this Mm -hmm. visual, what is the one thing I want them to know? And I'm telling you, a lot of times with charts, it's not exactly clear what the one thing is. And and it's the communicator's job um, to make that clear visually and verbally and in writing. So. I mean, that that just makes a lot of sense to me, Nancy. Regular listeners of this show know that, you know, I have a journalism background and I, I think of two things I learned there. I was a photojournalism major and I remember learning that, okay, the, the brightest spot in a photo is where your eyes go to yep. by default, which yeah. is why you don't want, you know, a backlit window behind the person you're, you're yeah. photographing, right? Yeah. Um, and also, you know, in design and just text layout, you know, just learning about the way that, you know, magazines and yeah, newspapers Hierarchy. Yeah. hierarchy, right? Yeah. If there's mm-hmm. if there's no one thing, then your eyes get lost, you get tired, and you move on to the next thing. And yeah. I think we forget about that as we communicate with charts and graphs and, and other visual forms. Exactly. And I think 
chunk of this book is about hierarchy, like not only on the slide itself, but also the hierarchy of the of the document, of the recommendation that you're making in the slide software. So it's kind of cool. I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it makes me think of it's, another journalism slogan, right? Like don't bury the lead. There's, yeah, there's so that. much data. You've done so much work to find that one nugget, exactly. lead with it. Lead with exactly. it, right? Exactly. That's a super good metaphor. I wish I put that in the book because that's exactly right. <laughs> well, uh, that's what we'll have to we'll have to share as you know our our main key takeaway from from this. If we've you know distilled some some good data from your research on data uh, in this one <laughs> podcast, uh, our our key takeaway is you know don't bury the lead. On that note, Nancy, any other key takeaways as we wrap today for B two B marketers who are trying to tell better stories with their data, make it stick, communicate visually more succinctly, um, in a more compelling fashion that drives action. Anything else you want to leave folks with today? Um, I think one of the other things that takes uh, some creative thinking when you're working with data is how to make it relatable. So we're starting to work with numbers that are just unprecedented in business history, right? We're, we just like let millions and billions blurt out of our mouths without really understanding the scale of some of these <laughs> right. numbers. Yeah. And so sometimes when you're trying to persuade somebody to take up your recommendation you're making from data, you can make the data more relatable by connecting it to something that they're familiar with. Um, and there's tons of examples um, in the book about how to take something like the word million or billion and translate it into something. So they're like, oh, wow. They get their head around the number. And they're like, oh my gosh, the scale of this problem or oh my gosh, the scale of this opportunity. I get it. And you make it more uh, tangible by connecting your data to a relatable thing or a relatable person or a relatable speed or a relatable distance or something like that. So that's another thing that I'd love everyone to take a look at because it's a really powerful way to persuade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of a segment I saw on CBS Sunday morning a few weeks back talking about dollar stores. And the, mm -hmm. the correlation on the number of dollar stores was there's more dollar stores in America than McDonald's and Starbucks locations combined. Now, oh my gosh. That wasn't, that wasn't oh right. There, there we go. See, they did yeah. a good job of it. And that wasn't even like, you know, you think of, well, that's that's like, you know, circling the earth 10 times with, exactly. you know, a humans laid down. Like you can go that route, but sometimes it could be a little closer to home. You know, mm -hmm. we just, in in that example that I just shared, got you to say, oh, oh my, my goodness, God, sir, exactly. right there. But exactly. it was just comparing retail locations to other retail locations, yeah. but it was something that was easily recognizable that you know people are going to have a mental picture of and, and how they can compare well, it. That's as the you problem. It, it like these context. numbers are so big. If I was to say, that's like going to the moon and back 22 times. How far is the moon? I haven't been to the moon. Have you been to the moon? Yeah, you haven't been to the moon. No, yeah, did, very good right? point. So you have to translate it into something they can connect to, just like what you did, where they're like, oh my God, that's a huge number. And um, there's real tips and tricks on how to do that. So there's a, a section about that. I love it. Well, Nancy, I could continue this conversation for yes, a long I. time. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. I feel like it's gotten just better as you and I have spent uh, more time together today. For folks who want to stay connected with you, want to uh, continue following your content, maybe find a copy of Data Story, what's the best way for them to reach out, stay connected, or find the book? Yeah, so um, we have Duarte.com. I'm up on Twitter at Nancy Duarte, up on Facebook, all the, the LinkedIn. I actually connect to everyone who connects to me. The books are online in all the places and in uh, physical stores too and at airports right now for the next few months. They're all over the airports, which is fun. Oh, very nice. And I can tell you, you know, uh, if you're looking to uh, to read on a plane and actually consume something and not just, you know, something that will put you to sleep, there's tons of visuals <laughs> and will keep you engaged and um, could actually make that flight more productive. So I oh. uh, definitely recommend that if you're, if you're traveling here. So I'm glad you made that note. Well, Nancy, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Hey everybody, Logan with Sweetfish here. If you're a regular listener of B2B Growth, you know that I'm one of the co-hosts of this show, but you may not know that I also head up the sales team here at Sweetfish. So for those of you in sales or sales ops, I wanted to take a second to share something that's made us insanely more efficient lately. Our team has been using Lead IQ for the past few months, and what used to take us four hours gathering contact data now takes us only one. We're 75% more efficient, we're able to move faster with outbound prospecting, and organizing our campaigns is so much easier than before. 
I'd highly suggest you guys check out Lead IQ as well. You can check them out at leadiq.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-Q.com.